So contrary to popular opinion of the world and the rationalizing of man, sex is not needed to survive. Look at the Lord Jesus, the perfect God-man, who's our example. The perfect human life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, who never engaged in it. So it's not a need. Letter B, after the fall, after sin entered the picture of the divine storyline in Genesis 3, sex is still called honorable. For instance, in Hebrews 13.4, if you want to run there with me, Hebrews 13.4, We read, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The marriage bed, that phrase is based on, or that's translated from the Greek word koita. Sex in marriage is what God says is pure, holy, and undefiled. It is without pollution. God made it that way. Man's the one that's perverted it. Letter C. Therefore, any other view but God's view, pure and holy, is a sinful view. It's not uncommon to deal with somebody with a sinful view. It might be the new wife who's struggling with the idea of sex, perhaps all of her life. She's heard nice girls don't do that. And none have come alongside and told her that godly girls do that in marriage. Perhaps she had a mother that complained and warned that that's all a man wants. Or perhaps her experience growing up was parents who slept in separate bedrooms. My first ministry years ago, we had a couple that was singing in the choir and everyone in the church but me knew that they lived in separate bedrooms at opposite ends of the house. So if it's the young gal who's now got problems in her sexual relationship with her husband, Perhaps she says, I don't want to talk about it. It's yucky. Kind of like the college kid that my wife and I went to school with who used to speak about kissing that way. That's just yucky. Or maybe it's the husband who's had the wrong view of sex, which many times is the case in our sex-crazed society in our worldly churches. Maybe he thinks that it's dirty based on all the locker conversations that he endured growing up what he's seen in movies, or experienced with his friends. If you're a parent, let's pull over and park here for just a second. In the home, not the school, provides a good environment for sex education and premarital counseling. Even in the parents, being not embarrassed to show affection for one another in a discreet manner. It has been more than once that my kids have seen me chase my wife around the house. I think I'd mentioned at the outset of today's lecture that uh, there is another upload on my website, Puberty, Purity, and Sex. Since over 25 years of ministry, in my experience, I have found parents shirking their shepherding responsibility in this area. Beloved, talk about it. When somebody says they are embarrassed or uncomfortable talking about sex, that is a learned behavior. We've learned a sinful view of sex. It's not God's view, it's man's view. Like the man I was counseling who um, didn't want to talk about it. And he claims faith in Christ. I said, well, you better get used to talking about it because God's got a lot to say about it. Or like the wife who uh, in doing marriage counseling when she and her husband, she's a preacher's kid. And she was raised in a, in a legalistic church. And so even though her husband was being counseled for sexual sin issues, she had her own issues of sex sins. She, um, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, wouldn't engage in sex because she thought it would be a perversion of the Lord's Day. Well, that's man's view, not God's view. We ought to be convicted by any sinful views that we've got. Number, letter C. 
what you just said, any other view but God's view is a sinful view. Notice the question. Do you view sexual relations in marriage just as holy and pure as praying to God, as reading the Bible, as preaching the Bible, as giving your offerings to the Lord, as teaching a Sunday school class? Point number two. Principle number two. Sex is not the basis for marriage. That's the problem with premarital sex. Premarital sex bases the relationship on lust, not committed love. Sex is not the basis for marriage. It's not the first and for, it's not first and foremost a physical union. To say that is to say that marriage is not legalized sex. Jesus is the one who settled that issue with the woman at the well in John 4. Um, while I'm being a fly in the ointment, let me just kind of hack away at the traditional Roman Catholic view. The Roman Catholic view of marriage is that a couple is not officially married until they consummate the relationship in sexual intercourse. Until marriage is consummated, they're not considered married in the view of the church. That becomes their basis for annulments. Again, that is man's view, not God's view. As I said that Jesus settled the matter in John 4, if you wanted to join me there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John 4, verses 16 to 18. He said to the woman, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. So here you got a gal who had had five different husbands, and he says that the man that she's shacked up with now, the one she's living with, was not her husband. So they may be having sex, but they're not, in the eyes of God, married. So Jesus settled the issue, letter A. Letter B, unity in marriage is more than sex. Let's unpack that principle for a minute. Number one, sex is not what makes a marriage successful. You understand that? You might not have... Um, um, even be able to physically be able to have sex. What about if you've got a disability or something? You see, man's mistaken view is that you need to be compatible. It's not a matter of compatibility. It's a matter of commitment. Now, we're not trying to minimize the importance of sex in marriage. It's a vital component. And it's very important. But that's not what makes a marriage successful. Number two, before sexual unity, there must be that unity called companionship. Rehearse in your mind the very first video in our Marriage Refresher, where we stated that God's primary purpose of marriage is companionship. This is essential to a good sexual relationship. If you only get one point, it's that a good marriage relationship is the basis for and is the key to a good sexual relationship. Don't get the cart before the horse. It's not the other way around. And unity in marriage is more than sex. When we talk about the one flesh relationship in Genesis, it's so much more than the marriage bed. It is emotional oneness it is intellectual oneness it's spiritual oneness not just physical oneness though physical oneness is part of it letter c although sex is not the basis of marriage it is very important it's a very central point prominent and essential part number two not to participate wholeheartedly and aggressively and passionately is sin and it ought to be called sin number three so the marriage partners should be enthusiastically involved in the riches of a biblical sexual relationship 
It says by action that God's word and your mate are not important enough for you to put forth the effort if you don't understand the importance. To say that is to say, letter, small letter A, passive sex is not biblical. In fact, passive sex is selfish sex. It's not about you. It's about your mate. So far, we have said that sex in marriage is pure and holy. It's not the basis for marriage. And number three, the primary goal is giving. It is providing sexual satisfaction. It's about meeting the needs of your spouse. That is the goal. That is the purpose. And that is what is taught by God in 1 Corinthians 7, 3. Run there with me if you would. 1 Corinthians 7, capital letter A, it is taught by God in 1 Corinthians 7, 3, which reads, The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Number one, the context of this passage, the Apostle Paul is talking about sex and marriage. He's speaking to both spouses, not just one, and they are given equal responsibility. Notice some of the terms he uses here. Gander first at that word, fulfill. That is to give fully completely without reluctance, hesitation, or inhibition, what is due. To give your mate, to give to your mate enthusiastically and joyfully, recalling that the primary goal is giving and not receiving. Notice the second word, number three, duty. The husband must fulfill his duty. It's a, a duty with the idea of doing good to the other person, giving the other person what they need. Marriage makes us not only legitimate, but also makes it an obligation. It's the good that results from the sexual relationship. He's to satisfy her sexual desires, meet her needs, keep her sexually satisfied. It's his duty for her benefit. So the goal is giving to satisfy her, not getting to satisfy self. You know, we need to understand that this is the antithesis of most sex on TV, in the movies, in the literature, in the locker room talk, etc., etc. Number four, the wife has the same command. She's got the same responsibility to sexually satisfy her husband completely, enthusiastically, and without reluctance. Now, as we go to capital letter B, that it is taught by the definition of love, that of giving. The primary goal of the sexual relationship is to satisfy your husband. There's a lot of excuses that can be made for avoiding sex. Perhaps a young man is so busy in his ministry or at his job that he's got no interest in it. So he ignores the needs of his wife. Since he's got no desire, well, she must not have any desire. And so he ignores her communication, her touches, etc., and problems result. Or possibly it is the tired housewife. Perhaps some allow their own personal desire to determine participation. It is based on an emotional response rather than biblical principle. But if one spouse wants to have sex more or less than the other, he or she must put the other's needs above his or her own. This is a Philippians 2, 5 to 8, serving and preferring mentality that is given to believers. So when we say letter B that this is taught by the defini definition of love, love is giving, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his son. Galatians 2, 20, Ephesians 5, 25, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, by definition, love is giving. That's the problem 
with porn and wrongly called adult movies. Actually, they're not adult movies. It's more childish because the focus is on self. Since the goal is getting, the person is never going to be satisfied. This is moving away from love, not becoming more loving. Again, referring to the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul calls believers to put away childish things. It's time to adult, really adult. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, we're living no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us. Thus, the Bible even deals with such issues as the sexual sin of masturbation. Because the goal is wrong. It is satisfying self. It is getting. It's not giving. This is a contradiction to the principle we just looked at. The practice of masturbation builds selfish habits that will produce difficulties in marriage. Years ago, I was counseling a guy that said that when he embarked on puberty and found out the pleasurable sensation, he began masturbation 46 times a week, so that over decades it became an enslavement in his life. Why is that? Because it, it controls people. It keeps them living in a fantasy world. If you build those sinful habits before you get married, your, your spouse is not going to fulfill you like your own fantasy world in your own mind. It encourages a, a life built around self-gratification. Look at the beloved Apostle Paul. He wouldn't be brought under the power of anything. He said, I, I buffet my body and make it my slave. So dear friend, if you're living in bondage, reach out to a biblical counselor. I've got further articles and booklets on the matter if you're interested in studying up on it. So we're saying, number one, getting is selfishness. And giving to get is selfish. Number two, the greatest pleasure in biblical sex is giving. Jesus said it is more pleasant to give than receive. And when the Apostle Paul reiterates this truth, he quotes the words of the Lord Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35, and he uses it in terms of blessing. It is more blessed to give than receive. Many have not grasped this, so husbands end up manipulating their wife for sex. He thinks that as a leader, he's got the right to demand it, or maybe some books have wrongly taught him this. Or perhaps it's the wife trying to manipulate her husband with sex. She'll let him have it when he pleases her and other things. Do a certain amount off your honeydew list. Use it as a reward for pleasing her. They've lost sight of the definition of love. That it's not getting, it is giving. And the goal is not about climax. It's about fulfilling our duty. 1 Corinthians 7.3 the sexual encounter may or may not include climax. This is an important biblical principle left out of many of the books on sexual relationships. Don't misunderstand the, the wife and husband experiencing orgasm isn't bad. God could have uh, created uh, a way of populating the earth with children to be a, a painful and less pleasurable thing than sex between a husband and wife. Certainly a wonderful gift from God, but it cannot be the goal. Again, don't lose sight of the phrase Paul uses. Fulfill duty. That focuses on your mate, not yourself. Therefore, your spouse will be the one to determine if climax is to be part or even necessary. Number three. Even the physical change needed for the husband to function sexually and have intercourse with his wife can occur from the anticip anticipation of giving pleasure, not only for anticipating the pleasure that he'll receive. We're not ignoring the reality that there is physical enjoyment in sex and in climax. But there's a higher motivation from which pleasure also comes. So underscore in your mind again, the principle of giving. What would the world say to this view? You might say, well, how do I know what pleases my mate? 
I'd simply say talk about it. Communication is so vital in the relationship. For example, both husband and wife make a detailed list of things that you enjoy in sexual activity and things you don't enjoy. And after you line item it, exchange your lists with each other. You might say, well, isn't that focusing on myself? Well, not necessarily. It depends on how you handle the information. Living for the glory of God, a lot of it is we're in the information game. We want to listen to our mate. We want to draw out their heart like deep water, says the Proverbs. So how you handle the information? I think we could illustrate the story this way. Wife says to husband, honey, what do you want for dinner? Well, husband requests T-bone steak. Is he being selfish? Not necessarily. We've got to wait in the story to see what she fixes. Well, she fixes Wonder Casserole with leftovers. All the fixings left over in the fridge. And you wonder what's in it. Mystery meat. She hasn't told him what the meal would be. She simply asked him what he wanted, and she goes ahead and fixes supper. Again, in his mind, he's thinking, steak, yeah. And he sits down, and there's no steak. So his response at that moment, at that why in the road, is going to tell us if his initial request was selfish. At this point, if he clams up, gives his wife a cold shoulder, or if he blows up and calls it slop or garbage, those responses, either or, then the initial request was selfish. Now he's mad. He can't have what he wanted. However, if the response at the Y in the road is that he tells his wife how much he enjoyed the food and appreciates her efficient use of leftovers, his original request was not selfish. You know, I think of a grandfather I had that uh, I was told the story of how diplomatic he was. My grandmother would cook everything from scratch and uh, she'd try something new and, well, if Gramp didn't like it, he would say, well, thank you, Barbie, for making the supper, but we don't have to do that again. So, again, back to this husband in the scenario. If he tells his wife how much he enjoys the food, appreciates her effort, her use of the food instead of it getting thrown out, he was giving her information she requested and could use. Being willing to accept her reasons for not fixing steak is crucial here. Willing to allow her to prepare it another time is also a way of serving. The same is true in the sexual relationship. The goal is satisfying and serving our spouse. Each should ask the other for a list of things that please and satisfy the other in the sexual relationship. When the list is given, it is given not to expect what's on the list or to be disappointed if nothing happens. When you give your list to your mate, you give up the right to have anything on the list. If you demand what you want, you become selfish. If you are unkind to the other by coldness or harshness for not getting what is on the list, you're selfish. So what, what's needed is loving, open, biblical communication essential to a good sexual relationship. We sometimes have a wife in counseling who only experiences her husband's affection when he wants the marriage bed. Only warm, loving, and affectionate when he has a selfish goal of getting something. Not showing her love, but getting on his part. The wife sees the selfishness, sees it's not love motivating him, but a desire to get something from her. Also, the husband might think his wife is not satisfied unless she has climax. He's not satisfied unless she's got one. So he needs to understand that there are times that she's satisfied just being close to him and pleasing him. And perhaps she'll have a desire for climax the next time or maybe not at all. That's why communi communication is absolutely imperative. So it's more important in relearning the biblical method. Relearning the biblical method. 
That leads us to point four, principle number four. God has created both with an equal ability to satisfy each other. Now, let's continue on in 1 Corinthians 7. We read verse 3, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife, verse 4, does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So in verse 4, he addresses both spouses again, and he uses this word authority. Now, uh, again, look at this principle number four. The difference in anatomy and physiology are obviously complementary. One is not greater or more important than the other. 1 Corinthians 7, 4, as both parts of the couple, both spouses are addressed, the issue of authority comes up. And authority is a word that means control. She doesn't have independent control of her body or full and entire authority over it. Let her be meaning she does not have power or authority over her body to use it for self. Her focus is to be satisfying her husband. Her eyes are on husband, and her body was given to be invested in satisfying her husband. Notice capital B. Both husband and wife have this same command again. She must use her body to meet the needs of her husband. Some wives think this is taken over leadership because she's to be aggressive in the sexual relationship. Now, let's give a note here of wives and initiation. There are many other areas where she is aggressive, quote unquote, without problems. When she's preparing meals, getting groceries, decorating the house. She's taking these on. She's fulfilling those responsibilities. Small letter B. She aggressively fulfills responsibilities in many areas of life and does so because she considers those her responsibilities. And these are not as specifically spelled out as the sexual responsibility. So she must be as aggressive in meeting the needs of her husband. This is also in the realm of her responsibility. Thus, a wife that's not aggressive in sex sins and is selfish. It's irresponsible for her to wait for her husband to ask her to do each of her home responsibilities. She just does them. It's equally irresponsible or sin for her to wait on him to express his sexual desire. He should be satisfied by her he doesn't need to ask. Again, use the list that you put together. There's no difference in the wife's ability to use her body to satisfy her husband and the husband's ability to satisfy a wife. Husband does not have greater ability, so cannot be called the aggressor. The wife does not have less ability, so she cannot be called the responder. Capital letter C. What about the different levels of desires? The Bible nowhere tells of those differences did not happen because you have learned or certain circumstances. Thus, a person can change. Small letter B. Levels of de desire can be relearned and retaught. But what if it's not something that's learned? If it's the way we're made, someone might ask. Well, if that's true, the issue isn't different levels of desire, but biblical instruction. We just teach the Bible. Since the goal is giving, God gave the body to be used for that, focusing not on desire, but on how to please their mate. The problem isn't how a person is made, but a willingness to obey God. Hiding behind such terms is rebellion. It's insisting on authority that you no longer have because a ring is on your finger. 
It's insisting on authority over your own body rather than using that body to please God in the sexual relationship with your mate. So neither mate can be passive. Selfishness and bargaining are sin. Capital